Hey everyone, Dr. Jack Audi, and in this video I'm going to be jumping into the pathophysiology of Alzheimer's disease. Now if you haven't seen my introductory videos into Alzheimer's disease, I really recommend going back and watching those, because in this video I'm going to jump into the deep end a little bit. Now behind me you can see a couple of sections of brain, one from the healthy human tissue, which is full and plump and what you expect to see when chopping a brain and one is of the Alzheimer's disease tissue here. Now what you can see it's shrunk away and it's shriveled up and that's tissue atrophy caused by neuronal death. So it's really a loss of all your functional brain cells which causes uh, memory decline, uh, cognitive decline and eventually motor decline and eventually death. Now pathophysiology essentially means bad physiology or bad molecular cellular and systems biology it's kind of what physiology means so it's the molecular and cellular mechanisms that underpin the disease of alzheimer's disease so let's jump into it here we have a synapse this is the connection between two neurons this is where your thoughts are held within the synapse within the connections between your neurons now these connections are formed with the help of hundreds of proteins but one of those proteins that helps synapse formation is the amyloid precursor protein it's a transmembrane protein like this and it sticks out into the synapse to help the synapse form now like all proteins it's chopped and cleaved and cleared and recycled um, and it's chopped up into fragments to help that recycling process now in Alzheimer's disease for whatever reason we end up with excessive beta uh, excessive fragments of this amyloid precursor protein that we call beta amyloid this is all in the previous video so I jump into it a bit more detail in those videos but essentially this beta amyloid has a unique property of being a very sticky protein and it starts to stick to itself now first it comes as a monomer which means a single amyloid then it sticks together to form an oligomer which means many amyloids stuck together and then those oligomers stick together to become insoluble fibrils now these fibrils become the amyloid plaques it's one of the most notable histological features of an alzheimer's brain now what enzymes are cleaving this amyloid precursor protein well first up we have beta secretase and it chops it just in the extracellular domain outside the cell um, on the protein there so it chops off this uh, big chunk of the amyloid precursor protein Next we have gamma secretase, um, which is, you know, it's an enzyme that helps secrete a protein. So secretase is not a bad name for it. So next we have gamma secretase. Now these enzymes actually sit within the membrane and they have um, uh, membrane spanning domains within the complexes. Um, and they're made up of many proteins. So the gamma secretase will then cleave it um, below and we'll end up with a small fragment of 40 to 42, sometimes 43, sometimes a little bit 50 uh, amyloid fragment. And this is that amyloid fragment that can then stick together to form those damaging oligomers and fibrils in Alzheimer's disease. Now there is a non-amyloidogenic pathway, so this is a way to process the amyloid precursor protein in a safe way, and it involves alpha secretase. Now you're probably already imagining drug targets, if you're like me, you're thinking, hey, why don't we inhibit those enzymes to help promote the non-amyloidogenic pathway? So leave it up to alpha secretase to chop up the amyloid precursor protein and give drugs to inhibit the amyloid pre the uh but the beta secretase and the gamma secretase now they have tried this many times in clinical trials and every time it's failed and i might jump into why a little bit later on the videos when i start to cover amyloid versus tau because there's a bit of a complicated story going on here i'll just give you a preview it's likely that you have a lot of amyloid and amyloid plaques in your brain at the age of 50 or 60 even though cognitive decline doesn't typically hit until 75, 80. So you've got 20 to 30 years of this amyloid building up. So if you give the drug too late in the disease, you've probably, you know, shut the gate after the horse is bolted, as we say. So the disease is already on its way. And so stopping the production of amyloid is probably ineffective at this stage. Okay, so let's zoom in. This is the amyloid precursor protein. Now I've got a string of letters along the top. Each of those letters correspond to amino acids. So we remember proteins are just long strings of amino acids. So you can write out the uh, protein code a lot like a DNA code. Just the string of the small subunits that make up the polymer that is the protein. So this is the long string of amino acids. And we're looking at the crucial zones where those enzymes actually cleave. 
So first we have beta secretase, it cleaves over here. And I don't want you to, it's not important to remember the specific amino acids here. It's just important to visualize what's going on at the protein. Then we have gamma secretase. Now gamma secretase can actually cleave in a few sites. It can cleave here between the A and the T. And that creates the 42 amino acid amyloid fragment. So that's the AB to 42 that we call, talk about. This is the most famous amyloid fragment associated with Alzheimer's disease. And if you count it up, there'll be 42 letters between those two cleavage sites. Now, gamma secretase can actually cleave here as well, which is just two amino acids to the left. And that creates the, um, that's 40 amino acids, and that creates the AB to 40 fragment. Now, you'll see why I'm talking about these two fragments coming up, because it's quite important when it comes to uh, uh, biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease. Now, the gamma secretase secretes right in the middle here, and so you can see you're not going to get the generation of that pathogenic AB to 42 fragment if you chop the amyloid precursor protein right here and split it in two. Um, so alpha secretase is a potentially very helpful enzyme in avoiding amyloid buildup. So we had that non-amylogenic pathway with alpha secretase and the amylogenic with beta secretase and gamma secretase. Those are the key takeaways. And you can end up with the amylogenic pathway. You can end up with two um, main types. There are other subtypes, but two main types of amyloid fragments being produced. And that's the AB to 42, which is 42 amino acids long, and the AB to 40, which is the 40 amino acids long. Right, so this is the amyloidogenic pathway, and this is that super important one for the disease. Now, let's have a look at how do we know that amyloid is involved in this disease. Now, I'm going to go into the amyloid hypothesis. I've already gone over it a little bit. I'm going to go over it a lot more later on. Um, but one of the main key pieces of evidence that amyloid is the initiating factor of Alzheimer's disease, the actual, actually it's necessary in order to get Alzheimer's disease, it's amyloid pathology, is the evidence under human mutations. So there are some human mutations out there that guarantee you to get Alzheimer's disease. And if you inherit this gene from a parent, you will go on to get Alzheimer's disease. And typically you get it quite young. Um, and when I say that, I mean in your 60s, which we deem early onset Alzheimer's disease. So this is um, 50s or 60s. Um, this is familial Alzheimer's disease because it's handed down through the family um, compared to sporadic Alzheimer's disease, which just pops up in individuals. Um, which is by far the most common. Uh, there's very few, we know the families that have familial Alzheimer's disease. So it's very rare, this familial Alzheimer's disease. But let's have a look at the mutations. Now, many of the mutations are in the amyloid precursor protein that causes familial Alzheimer's disease. So that's a really good piece of evidence that amyloid is involved in Alzheimer's disease because the familial Alzheimer's disease is caused by mutations in the amyloid precursor protein. And there's a few of them there. So a lot of them are around this side here. So here, um, how this diagram works is instead of this T, you now have an I, or instead of this V, you have an M. And each of these mutations typically live in isolation. So you, I, you either have this mutation, or you have this mutation, or you have this mutation. And if you have those mutations, um, so that's a change in your genetic code, which will change the amino acid sequence of the amyloid precursor protein in order to induce this amino acid change. So if you have just one of those, uh, you end up guaranteed to have Alzheimer's disease. Now, what it turns out is all of these mutations increase gamma secretase cleavage. So it promotes the cleavage of gamma secretase, and specifically, it promotes the cleavage of the uh, the cleavage using gamma secretase to generate the AB to 42 fragment. So when we look in these patients' cerebral spinal fluid, which is the fluid that your brain floats in, we find. Um, uh, a higher ratio of amyloid 42 compared to amyloid 40. So we find more amyloid 42 to, compared to amyloid 40. So gamma secretase has promoted that cleavage site through that mutation. Now you'll notice some of these mutations are just beside the cleavage site and not at the cleavage site. And that's because enzymes are quite complicated. They're like um, a key going into a lock and then you chop the key in half. All the key is important in terms of fitting into the lock. So the protein has to fit exactly in the right cleavage site, and then the cleavage will take place. So structures and amino acids outside of the cleavage site are critical to the protein actually getting into the enzyme where it will be cut. Now that's even more evident in this next mutation. So this is a mutation that promotes 
Beta secretase is one of the first mutations we ever found. It's a very famous one. It's called the Swedish mutation. And it's down here. And it's swapping out these two amino acids, the K and the M, for an N and an L. And that's nowhere near the B. Well, it's a, quite a few amino acids away from the cleavage site. But as I said, the protein has to fit into the beta secretase. And so obviously changing these two amino acids promotes it fitting into that beta secretase site to increase it, um, the 42 uh, uh, the 42 fragment. So it increases the amount of YE cleavage. And so it increases uh, amyloid beta 42 ratio to amyloid 40, I should say. Now, there are a, a few other mutations that cause familial Alzheimer's disease. And again, this all supports the amyloid hypothesis. Those are in the enzymes that cleave the amyloid precursor protein. So gamma secretase has quite a few mutations out there that cause familial Alzheimer's disease. And all of these mutations pretty much promote the cleavage and generation of the amyloid 42 fragment. So you can see by promote any mutation that promotes the generation of the AB to 42 fragment um, causes um, as a direct cause of Alzheimer's disease, which is a strong argument for the amyloid hypothesis. That is that this amyloid fragment is really the initiating factor of Alzheimer's disease. And so you end up with the overproduction of these fragments. So here we have the synapse. We've got too much amyloid protein and we've got too much enzyme activity that's generating all of these fragments. So overproduction and the clearance mechanisms can't keep up with clearing these fragments. And so you're going to get oligomerization and fibrillization. Now, from everything I've just said, you would expect Alzheimer's patients to have a higher level of AB to 42 in the cerebral spinal fluid compared to control, right? So all these mutations cause the overproduction of amyloid, so therefore you should have more amyloid, 42 particularly, in the cerebral spinal fluid, right? So if we look at this graph here, let me just explain these two graphs. Um, over here on the y-axis, we have AB to 42 levels. So this is if we take a sample of your cere cerebral spinal fluid, we actually do it down here um, in, in your... Um, uh, or oh, corda equinus, yeah, there you go, <laughs> in the bottom of your spinal cord where it's not really a, a solid fleshy tube, it becomes like a, a horse ponytail, which is where that term comes from. Um, that's where we take the cerebral spinal fluid. Now, if we measure, we're looking for amyloid, just a single monomer, the protein that is that 42 fragment, that peptide, the amyloid peptide fragment, right? Now, oh, so on the y-axis, we have the concentration. Each of these squares and each of these dots is a patient, is a person. Um, and down here, we actually have the ratio on the x-axis. We have the ratio of 42 to 40. So you remember that you generate both the 42 fragment and the 40 fragment from gamma secretase activity. And so here we have the ratio of it. So if you have more 42 compared to 40, that means you, you're, you're promoting that cleavage site to generate that pathogenic uh, amyloid fragment. Now, if we were to guess which graph corresponds to a cognitively normal person, a healthy person, and which graph corresponds to an Alzheimer's person, from everything I've just told you, you would probably guess that this is the Alzheimer's group because there's high AB to 42 levels and there's a high ratio of AB to 42 to AB to 40. And you would guess that this is the cognitively normal group because there's low AB to 42 levels and there's a low ratio of AB to 42 to AB to 40. But unfortunately would be wrong. The blue is the cognitively normal and the orange is the Alzheimer's disease. So that's a bit of a peculiar result, right? Why do Alzheimer's patients have lower levels of AB to 42 fragments? So that's a very important question. It's kind of puzzling when you're learning about Alzheimer's disease. You're like, wait, what? That's the best biomarker that we've got for Alzheimer's disease? And the answer is this, right? So this is the critical component of Alzheimer's disease is the oligomerization and fibrillization of amyloid. Now, whether it's the oligomers or fibrils that are the most damaging is still debated. I would say the evidence is pointing to the oligomers. But the presence of oligomeric and fibrillar amyloid is um, more associated with Alzheimer's disease than the monomers floating around. 
So if you imagine you've got this amyloid floating around in a healthy person, but in an Alzheimer's person, they're all sticking together and clumping. I should also mention that this process is kind of a, a term that we use autocatalytic, which means that once you get a little bit of it, 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 it accelerates that reaction. So it causes more of it and more of it and more of it. So if you take a mouse and you inject fibular amyloid into their brain, more amyloid will clump onto it at an accelerated rate. It's kind of like um, uh, a little seed that promotes the oligomerization of amyloid. So there's less free floating amyloid around the place because it's all oligomerized or fibrillized into the plaques and oligomers. And so that's why when we sample your cerebral spinal fluid down here, not on your brain, but down there, we find lower levels of A beta 42 and a lower ratio of A beta 42 to A beta. So they're probably overproducing it, which causes um, fibrillization and oligomerization, and that because it's autocatalytic, it accelerates and accelerates, accelerates the oligomerization and fibrillization process, causing the concentrations in the cerebral spinal fluid to drop. Okay, so that's what's going on there. Okay, so this ratio, the AB to 42 to AB to 40, is actually our best biomarker for Alzheimer's disease. So here we have memory performance and low, um, low AB to 42, a low ratio of AB to 42 to 40. In other words, we've got a higher level of AB to 40 compared to 42. Um, or a lower level of AB to 42 compared to 40 in this group, and their memory performance is much worse, whereas if you have a high AB to 42 to 40 ratio, then your memory performance is much better. So that's that surprising result, but it's one of the best biomarkers we have for whether or not, um, for example, if you have mild cognitive impairment, you're a bit forgetful, you're a bit um, low in your cognitive performance and you're concerned that you're going to accelerate into Alzheimer's disease, taking your cerebral spinal fluid and measuring um, your AB to 42 to 40 levels very carefully. This is such a fine balance that um, uh, basically they found that they had to get uh, robots to do this assay because it's so important to not have that variable human factor in this assay. Um, but yeah, so if you have a low AB to 42 to 40 ratio, that increases your likelihood that your mild cognitive impairment, your, your slight forgetfulness will progress into a full-blown Alzheimer's disease. All right, so up next in the next video, I'm going to cover this quite controversial topic, which is team amyloid or team tau. So there's two famous proteins associated with Alzheimer's disease. One is amyloid, one is tau. Scientists can get a little bit feisty about which protein is the most important protein. So I'm going to try to break down that argument in the next video.